It's Inside Africa, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of the program. For today, we're going to kickstart with Sudan. The incident involving Sudanese President Omar al Bashir in South Africa has raised serious questions about the ability of the International Criminal Court to arrest and hold an accountable leaders accused of war crimes. It has also called into question the level of cooperation from member states in carrying out arrests, but perhaps even more worrying is the prospects of AU states withdrawing from the ICC. Let's hear more. The African government says it will look into the departure of Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir in defiance of a high court order. In a statement on Monday, acting cabinet spokesperson Pumla Williams said, as indicated in court, government will inquire the circumstances under which President al-Bashir left the country, and it will also comply with the court order relating to submission of an affidavit outlining these circumstances. It will also see what are the reasons of the judgment as indicated by the court. The Southern African Litigation Center is strongly considering bringing contempt of court charges against government officials for allowing Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir to leave. Al-Bashir's exit has sparked anger from human rights groups, and the South African government has come under fire by the International Criminal Court, the United States Department, and the United Nations for rolling out the red carpet for Mr. Bashir to attend the AU summit. But it's believed that Jacob Zuma's government challenged the court's decision because it gave immunity to Bashir and all other delegates attending AU summit. There were rumors that South African soldiers in Darfur were being held hostage by Sudanese troops to secure al-Bashir's safe return to Khartoum. But the South African National Defense Force issued a media statement saying that there were allegations were ill-founded and that the troops did not come under any threat during this period. As a member of the ICC, South Africa had an obligation to arrest President Omar al-Bashir, but instead he left Waterkloof Air Force Base close to Pretoria, safely back home to Khartoum. Julie Shara, CCTV. In spite of the outpouring international backlash, authorities in Cairo appear keen to continue their crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood, the group which sponsored Moses' uh, rise to power. Now the report has more to tell us has received the toughest two sentences in the Egyptian law, the death penalty and life sentence, both in the same day. The former president has been defined to the court since the beginning of all his trials. He claims as the legitimate president of the country, he should be tried in front of a special court. In what appeared to be a political introduction to the verdict, the judge made sure to address this issue. <laughs> The people revolted in an honorable revolution asking the president to step down in a unique popular awakening the world has never witnessed before. So Mohamed Morsi's status as president and the rights he had as president of the republic have been revoked based on the referendum passed in 2014. The defendants seem indifferent to the verdict. They posed to the cameras and chanted against the Egyptian army and president. It's their routine in all previous trials. Most of them are dressed in blue and white. The next time they attend the court, most of them will be in red. That's the dress code for those sentenced to death. Some of the defendants who didn't previously receive the death penalty came today prepared for the death penalty, and they have already prepared their red clothes. For them, they were sacrificing everything. Some of them lost their wealth and had their children killed or in prison, so they have nothing to lose. They were ready for any verdict except the innocents. Almost all of the Muslim Brotherhood leaders have now received at least one death sentence. The spiritual leader, Muhammad Badia, was sentenced to death twice. Death penalties are automatically appealed in the Egyptian law. With the ISIL terrorists active in neighboring Libya, security experts in Tunisia are highly concerned over the spread of terrorism and extremism into their country. A security meeting in Tunisia's capital focused on the issue. The participants also proposed measures to stop terrorism from further spreading in northern Africa. The Tunisian Center for Global Security Studies held a conference in Tunis to shed light on the imminent impact of the wars in Syria, Iraq, Yemen and Libya 
on the whole region. The war on terror is on many fronts. ISIL controls oil reserves in Syria, Iraq and Libya, while Al-Qaeda controls some lands in Yemen. Meanwhile, the world is watching. If we don't act now, it will be too late to limit the global damage of those conflicts. Dr. Yav Sidawi from Geneva Center for Research and Studies blames the West and its regional allies for the advance of ISIL. He slams the trap of division which looms over the Middle East. Daesh is acting inside Syria and Iraq, as well as in the Libyan city of Sirte. Nobody has stopped the advance of this terror. Not even the U.S.-led strikes which have empowered ISIL. The West and its allies are inflaming its sectarian, tribal and ethnic conflicts to divide the Arab and Muslim world. Experts and human rights activists assert that the Israeli regime benefits from the instability in the Arab world. The Zionist regime is the first beneficiary from ongoing wars. The country that got involved directly or indirectly in the armed conflicts in Yemen and other sovereign states are threatening their own territorial integrity. Zionists do not need to wage a war because Arabs and Muslims are already killing each other. Military experts warn if Libya's Misrata city falls into the hands of ISIL, the terror organization will attempt to destabilize Tunisia by spreading chaos in southern cities. In Burundi, as clashes continue in Burundi, Jumbura against President Pierre's decision for a third term, rural parts of the country do not appear to be experiencing the same turmoil. But the president's opponents say that because it is difficult to speak out against the ruling party in the face of active intimidation. <laughs> Far from Bujumbura, the Burundian countryside seems little affected by the month of political protest and unrest in the capital city. It's quiet here. These troubles happen far away. We only heard about them on the radio. We are scared that it could spread here, that it turns into a war throughout the country. In this hill surrounding Pierre and Kurunziza's home region, the president and in his ruling party, the CNDD-FDD, still have significant support. He's done a lot of good things during the 10 years he's been in power. He built schools, implemented free health care for children under five, and our houses have been improved. But critics say it isn't easy to speak out against the running party. This opposition supporter says he was threatened for showing others how to vote for their candidates. They were in Bonerakure, the youth wing of the ruling party. They told me I didn't have the right to show people how to cast votes since the ruling party had already explained the process. They arrested me and demanded I meet conditions in order to be released. Opposition parties say they face intimidation and are harassed by the youth of the ruling party and the authorities, preventing them from campaigning. We didn't campaign because of the insecurity in the country. We couldn't do it. There have been abductions in broad daylight in various towns, and some of our members have been arrested. Officials in the ruling party deny harassment allegation. They say that there might be small groups of violent people on both sides, but that they have nothing to do with the official line of the party. 80% of Burundians live in the countryside, and their votes are expected to determine the outcome of the upcoming elections. An independent panel review in the United Nations peacekeeping operations has recommended sweeping changes to make UN soldiers more accountable for sexual abuse and other crimes. The chair of the panel, Josa Ramos Horta, called for zero tolerance for sexual exploitation and abuse by soldiers. In a bid to eliminate sex abuse from UN peacekeeping missions, the first major review of operations in 15 years has recommended that countries which flout children's rights be barred from blue helmet missions. Speaking after handing the peacekeeping report to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, former East Timor President Jose Ramos Horta, who chaired the 16-member panel conducting the review, called for zero tolerance on sexual abuse by soldiers. Member states must declare that when it comes to sexual exploitation and abuse, the staff of the United Nations should and will be held to the same standards, the same legal process, the same levels of accountability as the rest of the world's citizens. The report also recommended six-month deadlines on investigations. Compared to an average of 16 months, 
and an effective and adequately resourced victim assistance program. Ramos Horta also recommended that UN civilian staff face local justice. If in a given UN mission there is credible evidence against a particular individual, civilian, who uh, uh, operate under uh, the mission, uh, if there are credible allegation, allegations, the mission must facilitate immediately due process to take place in that country, beginning with investigation. It must cooperate with authorities. It cannot challenge, create difficulties to the, uh, the host country because that person automatically does not have immunity on that case. This is what has to be very clear. You commit a barbarity, you have no protection whatsoever. You are subject to the laws of the country where you are operating. You know, he cannot hide under uh, the United Nations roof. The UN has in recent times come under criticism of its handling of a case involving French peacekeepers accused of sexually exploiting children in the Central African Republic. Another UN report recently indicated that UN peacekeepers regularly butter goods for sex with people in the countries the world body is meant to be helping. Over 80% of UN peacekeepers are deployed to trouble sports in Africa. Somali residents struggling under Hawala money transfer bans in Kenya may have a viable alternative with the introduction of cheap car technology to the country. The transparent service, also accessible internationally, is expected to tap into the lucrative Somali diaspora money transfer market, which according to reports is estimated to be worth more than a billion dollars annually. In the launch of MasterCard, which will now enable yourself and the rest of your team and your ministers not to necessarily carry cash in their pockets, deposit their monies in their accounts, go wherever they are going, and be proud to show a card that is produced in our country. Chip card technology is growing pretty fast in Mogadishu, making it easier for Somalis to access their money. This is as a result of a partnership between MasterCard and the recently launched Premier Bank. The bank now issues and accepts the first MasterCard branded payment cards in Somalia. We've since issued about 1,000 MasterCards. Our target is to issue 5,000 before the end of the year, and in three to four years, we target to reach 250,000 customers. In a place like Mogadishu, given the unstable economic structure, ease in handling money is very important. And it's for this reason the bank is introducing the chip card technology. We are also uh, in, the, uh, in the progress of uh, introducing our point of sale purchases. That is where now we are going to, uh, you can use your card to enter a supermarket and just swipe instead of paying cash. And uh, other vendors as well, not supermarkets alone, petrol stations, shops and uh, hotels. The service allows customers to access their money outside of the country. It is a formal and traceable network that also complies with international security standards. Locals say access is faster and way easier than before. For example, the MasterCard has eased our handling of money. I work for a company and receiving money had been a long process. Wait for it for about a week, then receive it through the Hawala system. That's not the case anymore. We can access our money online, withdraw without necessarily queuing, or go into the bank. This technology and the ease it has brought is a new thing and it's exciting Somalis. Even President Mohamud tried it out for himself. Farmers in Zimbabwe will not receive the bumper harvest expected this season. Now the government is considering uh, investing 300 million, million US dollars to ease the burden of drought in at least three provinces in the country. But the 2014-2015 season has gone down by approximately 49% of the expected 1.4 million tons per year. Zimbabwe now needs close to 300 million US dollars to import food to drought prone provinces like Masvingo, Matebele land, north and south. As the current season has once again exposed our people to food and nutrition insecurity, 
most parts of the country did not receive adequate rainfall, resulting in inadequate harvests. Also, the poor rainfall has negatively affected our livestock as pastures have dried up. Government has, however, declared that in spite of the unfavorable situation, all our people must be protected from the vagaries of hunger and malnutrition. Local food experts have attributed food shortage in Zimbabwe to mainly inadequate involvement of the private sector, but also non-functional grain reserves, limited market integration for smallholder farmers, poor response to climate and disaster risks, and weak implementation of food policy and programs. Countries need to be supported with government in the lead, with civil society actively engaged, with the private sector doing its part. Experts on food security want Zimbabwe to follow the Chinese model of reducing food waste and establishing nutritional food sources to become food secure. China is in fact the country that has mo made the most progress in addressing hunger, but they are also the country, because of their large population, uh, that still has uh, a large number, over 120 million people undernourished. China doesn't need resources from WFP. It doesn't uh, need us to deliver food uh, in China. But China is asking for technical expertise. Zimbabwe's four-year national nutrition strategy, which was launched in 2014, has acknowledged that maternal malnutrition from conception during pregnancy and through to lactation is closely associated with the increased risks of stillbirths, miscarriages, low birth weight, and maternal infant mortality, which the country is striving to curb. Peanut producers in Senegal are benefiting from a surge in demand from Chinese buyers and most lo local growers are reaping the rewards of significantly higher prices. However, local peanut oil producers now see their supplies have been affected. Senegalese peanut farms are eagerly awaiting Chinese buyers to purchase the upcoming harvest. Chinese economic operators are always welcome to the groundnut basin. We are waiting for them to start the next marketing year set for November and December 2015. Chinese buyers purchase the peanuts at significantly higher prices than the local market. Peanuts are regularly sold between 250 and 300 Central African francs compared to the usual local fixed price of 200. I would like to express my satisfaction with Senegal cooperation with China. The Chinese bought our products last year at good prices, and this helped us very much as farmers. However, some farmers believe not everyone is benefiting from the growing trade. We heard that some people among us sell to the Chinese their products at very interesting prices, while we are not informed. And in the meantime, we are suffering by selling our products to people who don't pay us well and others that are taking advantage of us in the transactions. As a result of the increased Chinese demand, the government of Senegal has encouraged farmers to increase peanut crop production. The government says the export market to China has boomed since being opened up to Senegalese imports. For two years, China's doors were closed to peanuts from Senegal due to sanitary and phytosanitary issues related to the quality of peanuts that was supposed to come from Senegal. Any peanut coming from West Africa, Gambia and elsewhere was considered to be coming from Senegal. A protocol was signed last year and this year the implementation of this protocol gave extraordinary results. Despite the government's enthusiasm, local peanut oil companies say they are struggling to supply their factories, as peanut farmers are rushing to Chinese buyers.
Today our factory is temporarily inactive. We are in May and it was during this month that the factories were running till the month of October. Today, in two months, we are done. It means that there is a real lack of seeds. We had to split among our four mills 100,000 tons of peanuts that is extremely preoccupying and extremely serious for the future of oil mills in Senegal. For now, however, most within Senegal's peanut industry seem to be extremely positive about the growing Chinese market. And that's good news for the economy as a whole. The industry is a major employer, with almost half of the country's cultivatable land being used to farm the ground nut. In Kenya, the risk from being subjected to U.S. sanctions for failing to comply with the minimum standards of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Now, TV2 has more on the problem of human trafficking in Kenya. 27-year-old Ruby, not her real name, listens attentively during an awareness seminar on human trafficking. Ruby was a victim of human trafficking, an ordeal that lasted just over a year. Last year, she registered with an agency that promised her work in Libya as a caregiver to the elderly. Being her family's sole breadwinner, she hoped to send part of her income back home to take care of her mother and siblings. But when she reached Tripoli, her passport was confiscated and she was later subjected to both physical and sexual abuse. The session she's attending is a seminar in which trafficking victims are equipped with business skills. Ruby says a lot needs to be done to bring human trafficking to an end. Most people are supposed to be educated about human trafficking so that they get awareness and they get to know what happens and creating job opportunities, mostly in Kenya. Because a lack of jobs is what tends to give people ideas to get those outside jobs. Ruby is one of 200 victims rescued by Awareness Against Human Trafficking, or HEART, an organization formed four years ago to combat human trafficking in Kenya. For the past three years, Kenya has been on the U.S. State Department's Tier 2 watch list for failing to seriously tackle the problem. Three years ago, Kenya enacted its Counter Trafficking in Persons Act, but the law has had little impact on curbing human trafficking. The Cradle, a children's protective foundation, says there have been very few successful prosecutions because of the high threshold of evidence required to obtain a conviction. Meet Sophie Otiendo, a project consultant at heart. Today, she is moderating the business training session. 17 years ago, Otiendo herself was a victim of human trafficking. She has since recovered from the trauma and uses her experience to encourage and empower those in similar situations. She says greed is what fuels this global scourge. So long as we want to get things cheap, there's always going to be trafficking. There was slavery, now there's trafficking because we need different things and we have to find a way to make to get them in the cheapest possible way and that trafficking is the fuel. The International Labour Organization says human trafficking is the second largest source of illegal income worldwide, exceeded only by drugs trafficking. And according to UNICEF, 1.2 million children are trafficked every year. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that was it for today's edition of Inside Africa. Thanks for watching once more and stay tuned for more programs on Africa Media. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow. Goodbye.